and I'm halfway through my fill, and then this four by four screeches up next to me, yeah. So my man jumped out of this four by four, yeah. Full camouflage fatigues, big beard, big assault rifle. Literally. Can I just break at this point? You better not tell me to edit this shit. Nah, it's cool. It's cool. Tequila Keller podcast. Tequila Keller official You need the Kellervision app. Twenty four seven mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. One, two, one, two. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct central London or central as you need to be, want to be, could be, should be, or need to be. Trust me, in this day and age, you can never be too careful. Um, big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. If you haven't checked out the Kellervision app also, then get your, get your fingers on it. Start thumbing that shit, okay? All street culture, 24-7, free download. Um, well, we've got a guest inside. He's Don in the game, so, you know. It would be rude not to, right? Ladies and gentlemen, TDO, TKS, I mean, he's here. He's got the numbers. He's got the names to prove it. This is the man like Cat. What are you saying, brother? Salute, my G. How What's are you? What's going on, bro? I'm blessed, man, yourself? I'm good, man. I feel ever so lucky, always. Again, I'm just like the... I, I'm the fan, I'm the conduit, and I just love it when people pass through. Enough <laughs> respect, bro. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on the platform. Thank you, man. Yeah, man. Uh, actually, you said uh, before we started that we had bucked some other times before. Long time ago. Do you know what? Because obviously, um, before... Being knee deep in the graph, I was very involved heavily in the music. Um, and I did a lot of drummer bass back in the day. I grew up on that, do you know what I mean? Like that, that was like the soundtrack to my childhood jungle, drummer bass. I remember probably one of my first real musical memories and influence was having a Walkman um, at school. And it, this was so old school, yeah, that you couldn't even rewind the tape here. Remember when you had to t- take the tape Hold over? Hold tight the Walkman crew, you know then, the deal. And you had to fast forward it, yeah, on the other side to get, to get back. And I remember um, one of my guys at lunch who was listening to these tunes and I was listening to it and he was listening to this tune that was banging and I was like, rah, what's that? And he was like, ah, oh, this is Nicky Black Market. And I just remember the name just sticking in my head and I was like, wow, like that's a cool name. Like, what is this? And then I said to him, I was like, let me borrow the tape, let me borrow the tape. So I borrowed the tape off him and then recorded it. Um, and then, yeah, I think from, from that age, we're talking like middle school, from that age I was a junglist, man, because... It just it just hit me deep, do you know what I mean? I'd never heard yeah. anything quite like that, like that that amalgamation of all those different sounds and Nicky was mixing um uh Chopper Tune and Original Nutter and he was like switching it up and oh, literally shit. I was just so like back that day. literally I was just like, Wow, what is this? Like I'd never uh, heard anything quite so energetic and so rough and rugged and raw. Rough and rugged is the great terminology for that era, man. Literally, man. And that was it. I, I remember I gave the tape back to my boy and then I was like, oh, have you got it's, some more? Yeah, you, you, you take that. Yeah, <laughs> man. Like, literally. And then from then on, um, I remember that uh, music was, was, was the thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, we all used to go to, like, little raves and uh, used to sneak in the raves and stuff. Because I was young, do you know what I mean? But I used to sneak in and then got to know, like, a few DJs and MCs and really started to just felt... Felt a part of the culture and then used to travel around doing raves and that whole tight X Man, my G from oh, way back. Uh, like, Don um, X Man, come on. My guy, like, he, he was a big influence and a big inspiration, do you know what I mean? Because I was young and I was seeing him smashing it and doing his thing. But he was a very humble, very real guy as well. Um, and yeah, before I knew it, I was doing raves up and down the country, uh, traveling around, partying, everything that comes with it, just staying in next cities and that, waking up in different yards, making bare friends and that. and. Yeah, I remember seeing you at plenty of raves, man. Like you were smashing it back then, doing raves with like air, um, up in yeah, Brum days. And yeah. yeah, you was on your thing, man. So I think one thing that I've learned on this journey is, yeah, that um, energy is a very important thing, yeah, and uh, vibration is a very powerful force. And when you, when you emit a certain vibration and a certain energy, kind of like magnets, um, you attract a certain vibration. So if you're working on a certain path or have like a certain ideology or mindset or intention, you are naturally going to gravitate towards individuals of a similar Mm. of a similar vibe. And that's probably why me and yourself crossed paths back in the day while I was working with all these individuals and doing that, because, yeah, we just had that drive and we just had that energy and that love. And there was never 
It was never really for like a monetary gain. It was mm. just because of the love. Like I loved music. I loved partying. Um, I loved socializing. I loved the whole element. I loved going to different areas. And yeah, graph was graph was hand in hand with with it's music it. and with like I remember when I came out of school and stuff like got into like upper school and then started like seeing tags and stuff like that. And then I remember traveling into London because I'm from out of London and traveling into London. And literally as you got the train in on the Euston line, as you got past like, like Watford, then places dead, the graph just like, it just appeared everywhere. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So all the way down the line, you might see a few dubs here and there, but then once you got into, into outskirts of London past like Watford, them mm -hmm. sides, it literally just exploded and I was always taken aback by this because even before I wrote and even before I painted, I used to think to myself like, how do these dons get everywhere? Like, how is this, how is this possible? Yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, do yeah, these yeah. dons like sleep on the train line? Like, what, like, how are they doing this to the extent that they are? And, um, bro, yeah. I, I honestly think dr drastic actions called for drastic measures. 100% bro, 100% man. And then once I did get involved, I was like, right, like I know now that like, this is not just, a hobby like don't get it wrong maybe for some people it is a hobby something they do for fun but there are there are people out there um that graph is their life do you know what i mean mm. this is this is a path and i know it's an element of hip-hop and hip-hop is a lifestyle in itself i see it's broader than that it's got um, bigger than that exactly but graph on its own now has taken on its own its own identity right. and its own path and it is it is um it is an amazing is yeah. an amazing path like graph what we refer to as graph, this um, this process, is a very ancient practice. Yeah, is a very very ancient practice, and is almost, um, is almost spiritual. Yeah. So take for example one of the earliest um, records of um, human history is um, these. These, these paintings on caves and these artworks in caves. You know, like France, I'm using France as an example, but there are many all over the world from Algeria, Africa, yeah, yeah, South America. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. there's this ancient art form on walls. So mankind, yeah, um, was recording his emotions on a wall, yeah, like thousands and thousands of years ago. Like we might refer to this as graph now and it might be kind of wrapped up in this hip hop culture. However, this practice that we're talking about of recording your emotions and your feelings or your intentions or just just the want to communicate in that way is a very ancient practice mm. and it predates the invention of the legal system. It pre the 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 invention of the written language. Like this this practice is one of the most ancient art forms on the planet. But it is so powerful that it um that it has received such almost like a bad press and so much of um so much of a negative connotation in public conversations because the system understand the power of um, of this and of this movement because, let me put it this way, you know when you get off the train, yeah, mm. uh, in the train station and you're walking up towards the platform, yeah, mm -hmm. what do you see all the way down the side of the, you know, like the little corridor that you yeah. walk, yeah, what do you see all the way alongside ads, there? Ads, ads, big, ads. big, big pictures of what, like, Lion King, McDonald's, Red Tail, like things that are totally irrelevant, in my opinion, mm -hmm. to uh, the betterment and the growth of humanity or bettering you as a person, yeah? Yep. These things are totally irrelevant, yeah? But they are plastered in your face, yeah? And not only are they plastered in your face, yeah? First of all, how long do you think that you are actually consciously aware and exposed to that image for like seconds, right? Seconds. Like, seconds. Probably, like most people don't even look at or it. Some they're damn that, brown shit. Exactly. They're that like they're that used to and that conditioned mm. and that normalized to being subjected to these images that they don't even think about it. Yeah. So if you're only exposed to that image, yeah, for how many seconds? Maybe even less than a second, and maybe not even consciously looking at it. How much do you think it costs to put an uh, an image there or an advert there? Like. How much? Yeah, like... God, I mean, maybe 30k? There you go, there you go. So, to expose an individual to your message, yeah, for less than one second can cost you thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds, yeah? Why do you think that is? Because these, these corporations and, like, these individuals, they understand the power of exposing your subconscious mind 
to this message and to this image and they will pay £30,000 to expose your Mad. mind subconsciously to a picture of a burger or to a picture of Lion King. And we don't even we don't even like take that in consciously. Do you know what I mean? We yeah. just we just we just go about our business. But like you said, like some Darren Brown shit, like some Jedi mind trick shit. Yeah, <laughs> they expose you to that. Yeah, and then mm. you may encounter an experience or something happens in your day or something like that. And then this thought enters your head, like or someone's talking about something, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I went to see that Lion King show. We took the kids, blah 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 blah." And then you're like, "Oh yeah." The Lion King, like I saw that advert when I was but coming all up, I think, Whenever I think of the Lion King, the only thing I think of is going up the escalator. There you go, bro. There you go. Pictures. And the same with me. Like, it's just <laughs> deeply embedded in your consciousness. So does that tell you, see? So what I'm getting at is, yeah, that the most powerful corporations and organizations in the world understand the power of um, images, of words, of advertising, of these things. Now, if, for example, like you get a graffiti writer they may have a totally different message to share with the world. Like, they, they may have something totally different to share with the world. They might not want to sell you burgers. They might not want to sell you some bullshit, yeah? They might want to contribute something else to the conversation. But because that individual doesn't have £30,000, yeah, hmm. to um, put their message out to society and to communicate with society, then their message and their word is deemed invalid and yeah. uh, is deemed not worthy of this conversation and of... Yeah. being in the public eye purely because of money. Graffiti writers and graphers have decided in in the nicest possible way, fuck you, I'm going to put my message out there, I'm going to put my image out there, I'm going to announce that I exist, I'm going to write whatever I want and you're going to deal with it. And the massive difference between advertising and corporations and what they do and graph writers is we're not actually trying to sell you something. We're not actually trying to uh, get you to buy into anything, yeah? Mm. M- majority of graph writers don't even write anything political or yeah. anything um, controversial. They just, write, they just mm. write their name. They're just announcing, I exist. I'm not selling you anything. I'm not trying to persuade you to do anything. I'm just announcing that I exist. Look at society's perception of graffiti and look at society's perception of advertising and being exposed to those images. Like, it's, it's insane because... Yeah, that is mad, isn't it? They see us as, like, the biggest problem in the world or, like, something that should be uh, stamped out and uh, sanitised. Look, look at how they buff graffiti, like... So, okay, actually, before we go any further, I'm going to just make a point here. Cap, K-A-P, a resident of the South Eastern community, hold tight. Graph writer, original, one T, hold tight. Reese, hold tight. Spat, hold tight. Come of course, on. TDO and uh, TKS, all area crew inside the place. Uh, if I did not mention that at the top of this, my apologies, we're jumping straight in it because that's what we do over here. Can I just uh, add, add value to what you were saying there? Because, yeah, go on, bro. Well, because what I'm thinking is taking those, taking that point, which is a really, really good point, but then twisting it a little bit. What if, what would change the public's perception? Because what it is, is when you see a marketing campaign or you see an advertisement for a product, there is a legitimacy in that product because it's had money invested into it. To the public's eye, they're just like, oh, oh, it's got to be real. Even though it's probably a new product and it's probably not been proven, it's probably like a couple of years old, but, but to have that exposure, bang! People just, I don't know, they have a level of expectation in marketing, don't they? It's almost like a, it's, it's, it's a... It's a um, yeah, it's just just commercial properties, really. But what what um what I'm thinking is, how's about if you were to get a Montana, or you know, or a Molotov, and not not wholeheartedly commit, but have them commit to a campaign? I, I mean, this is hypothetical, of course, because what we're talking about is is thousands upon thousands of pounds. But for argument's sake, would that create validity within? the graffiti movement, if a graffiti brand, a spray paint brand or any brand in graffiti were to adopt the same marketing campaign as these people were talking about. Because then that would, in part, give pe- sanitise people a little bit more into understanding, yeah, actually, you know what? I may not like that particular artist's piece that's just gone on a train or on that wall or trackside or whatever, but they're bona fide because the brand 
there's brands associated, which a lot of people don't even realise. When people see like a Hall of Fame, they just think it's a load of people that have just got spray paint. They don't actually realise that there's a there's a kind of background industry that plays. What would you reckon of that? Do you reckon that, that would give people a bit more of a perspective? To a certain extent, um, I think, and there's there's so many different um, there's so many different things that I could say to that um, because regardless of what any uh, company or brand ever does the brands and the companies that work um, alongside graffiti artists and graffiti writers are not all owned by writers, so they don't have a writer mentality and they don't have an understanding of um, necessarily what comes with being a writer. So regardless of what moves they make, I'm not sure you could ever... Graffiti is such a... It's lawless. It's, it's, yeah, it's such a... Um, almost like an anarchy movement that... No matter what anybody tries, um, and and we can see that many people have tried. For example, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but there are many street artists that have tried to steer graffiti in a certain direction for whatever reason, and they've been successful to a certain degree. But you will never, ever be able to change every writer or... Um, Conforming the cycle. Yeah or, yeah, or get every writer on board of anything. And the perfect example of that is... Just when you try and organise writers, like let's say you're trying to organise a mission or you're trying to organise a wall, like a big jam, yeah? And like, these are your boys, yeah? Like, these are your boys. You talk to them every day, you're chilling with them. But trying to get everybody in one place, yeah, at the same time to conform and to do the same sort of thing. Like, I'm saying like when you've got a theme for the wall or something and everyone's mm -hmm. got an idea, yeah? yeah you're always going to have one done that's like, oh, nah, like, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I want to do my thing, da, da 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 And then at the end of the day, who are we to say, my guy should conform and my guy should do this? Absolutely. Because yeah. graphic is the ultimate freedom of speech. And I think that's, that's something that we have to touch on as well, is that graffiti is the last real form of freedom of speech because everything else is Absolutely. censored and controlled to a certain degree. Absolutely. Um, social media, stuff like that. Like, so... For me, I think it's a nice idea, and obviously artists and brands <laughs> have done stuff like that, but... It's not speaking, realistic. Yeah, speaking from person, because I can only speak from my own uh, perspective as a writer and for myself, but me personally, I think that anybody or any organisation will struggle to ever uh, get graffiti to go in a certain way or to do a certain thing, because at the end of the day, if writers are not deterred by the ultimate punishment, which in this country is locking you in a cell and taking away your freedom. If they're not deterred by that, yeah, and they're not bought by the false, uh, the false gold of like doing like a totally different path of the graffiti and going down a monetary route mm. and just like monetizing your graph and stuff like mm. that. If they're not deterred and they're not bought by that, then they're probably never going to be... Yeah. You're never yeah. going to sway them. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, because there's such a purist element in graffiti and graft that there are people that will literally, and they have paid the ultimate price for it, and that is to lose their freedom or to lose their life. Do you know what I mean? So Yeah, I feel like um, having, you know, having friends that were in graffiti, are in graffiti, and meeting new new, new friends over the, over the course of me doing this, I feel like... Uh, what, what people don't understand is to not monetize. The choice of not monetizing what you do is, is totally, totally cool because when people become that name, become that writer, there's no divide between, okay, what's monetized and what's not. You're, it's, it's you embodying it as a human being. You are that creative. You're, you're the conduit to the, the art. You you know, I don't expect to get paid just being me. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's yeah. the same principle as being a writer. It's, 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 it's deeper than just a lifestyle, isn't it? It's deeper than just a decision you make as to this, just my perception and understanding. It's deeper than just, oh, I'm going to make money off this name today. It doesn't work like that. It's, it's 100%. deeper than that. And at the end of the day, p p people do that and they might make some kind of financial gain. Do you know what I mean? Like they might sell some work or something like that. But the love ain't there. Do you know what I mean? Like the love ain't there and mm. you can have money, but money again is just a, it's just a physical thing. Do you know what I mean? Money comes and money goes. It's, it, um, 
Whereas to have that genuine support and that genuine love that mm. comes from being a writer and being a part of the writer community, that's and worth, that's, and that's, people. that's priceless, man. You yeah. can't buy that. Do you know what I mean? So what, what I think I'm trying to say is, yeah, you can't go to college and you can't go to uni. You can go to college and go to uni and study art and learn to be an artist, yeah? But you can't go to college and university and get a degree um, in the underground. Do you know what I mean? Because the underground, yeah, you don't get your qualifications yeah, that's street by sitting knowledge. in an exam. That shit's street knowledge. There you, you have go. to learn it. There you go. And you don't buy that. You can't buy that because it's either given or it's not. Do you know mm. what I mean? And these things... Oh, school of hard knocks, um, man. You, you know, you, just, you learn as you get older. 100%, man. 100%. And I think any writer will tell you that, yeah, it's nice to sell some work. Yeah, it's nice to like, to do something financial with your graph. But really and truly the buzz and the love that you feel, yeah, just after executing, like, if you execute, say you execute, like, a flawless piece, yeah, which is very rare for a writer because we're so critical over our pieces, yeah, but say, you, say you've, say like, been planning this piece and then you execute it to the best of your ability and then you go home and you look at your flick, yeah, that sense of achievement, yeah, for me personally, is better than a financial um, gain mm. because I don't seem to get that same feeling from money that I do from love and love for the game and mm. love for what I do. Do you know what I mean? And mm. I, when I started out writing, I didn't start out painting because I wanted to sell work or because I wanted to sell canvases or, or do commissions or something like that. I started writing, truth be told, because it was truth an escape. Truth be told, we're yeah. getting spicy up like, in here. Come on, tell them truth. All right, speak cool. Up, so speak up. for me... Writing and graph was an escape, yeah? And it was an escape from physical circumstances, but also society. And also, um, it allowed me to change my perception of reality. And all of a sudden, what was a very mundane, um, authoritarian, strange experience, all of a sudden became almost like a game. It became like a game because I was young as well. I was very young. And all of a sudden, the world became like like a playground and everything became a canvas and everything became... My whole perception of reality changed once I started to write and once I started to paint because I started to see the world differently. And that was not through any substances or anything like that. It was purely just changing the way that I thought about things. Um, and obviously, we... we we could get into what led me to change my, my thought patterns and stuff like that. But I think a lot of people that go through some serious shit in their life and some real shit in their life, whether you're young or not, you start to reassess things and you start to think a little bit deeper. Mm. And I think when I started to think about... How old are you when you started thinking a little deeper? Young, man, young. Like mm. I was writing like 13, something like that. So early teens, you know what I mean? Like okay. literally very, very, very fresh into my teenage years. Um, music was playing a big part in my life and yeah I was I was out there and I was out there with my pen and all of a sudden I'd go out at like what eight o'clock at night with a pen in my pocket and then I'd be out all night till like I don't know like till the sun came up do you know what I mean like just out just catching reaches doing missions um, what's the what's the what's the intention of the repetition like do you ever do I mean, this is just layman stuff that I'm sure people, because we have a lot of people that ain't into graph that are just into like the criminology side of it and the idea of like what what's behind the motivations of it. Also, it's good for the heads out there. I know the earbud crew. Come on, but I'm um, I'm just kind of thinking, what what is the drive, and how far? I don't know when do you get knackered? Like, what's the drive? To be honest, at that age, I had so much energy. Like, uh. I still got energy. I still mm. got energy, and I'm still, I'm still in my prime. But back then, I was, I was young. Do you know what I mean? When you're young, when you're a teenager, you got bare energy, and I was just out there, never, ever, ever got bored, never got tired. I was so easily, I was so easily entertained and so easily pleased, and I, I, I was amazed that what, what I'd taken on board and what I'd started to partake in, all of a sudden, had changed literally my life, um, and not necessarily for the better because. Well, it's hard to say. I don't want to say it was for the better or not because obviously you go through experiences in life, yeah? And sometimes what you can perceive to be a negative experience at the time, yeah? Because 
things are going to shit and everything's falling around apart around you. But when you get past that stage in your life, if you persevere, which is key, like even when you're going through shit, you have to persevere and keep going. When you get past that stage, you can then later reflect upon that time and mm. upon that incident and say, do you know what? Shit. I know it was crazy and it was mad at the time, yeah? But if I hadn't have gone through that experience, that wouldn't have led me to this experience and this path now. That always so, blows my mind as well, yeah, yeah. So what you perceive to be a terrible negative thing may only be temporarily because that may actually be serving you in a higher purpose. And if you are prepared to grow and to learn um, and to better yourself and to better your experience, then these things serve as lessons do you know what i mean uh, and and you? you can turn a very negative bad experience into a learning curve like some of the most influential people um that have gone on to do amazing things in this world look at malcolm x do you know what i mean like he was in prison he was um selling drugs he was involved in pimping women stuff like that he was involved in some some of the darker side of life however that experience led him to go within like even though his physical freedom was taken he was free in his mind, yeah? Mm. And he found that freedom within his mind to deal within. Then, obviously, he educated himself. He started to read a lot more. Um, mm. And he then grew as a human being. He changed his name. And then when he came out of prison, he put into practice everything that he'd learned from, like, the street the from street the inside side. and outside, yeah. And then from being institutionalized and being yeah. at the system's uh, mercy and educating yourself then and putting all of that together to create this formidable force that was Malcolm X. Do you know mm. what I mean? And for anybody that doesn't know, he was one of the most influential yeah. figures. And I mean, like, the key, key, key subject matter that we're dealing with here really is growth. Like, if 100%, you're, bro, 100%. If you're prepared to... Uh, uh, and, like, in the very essence of a game, if you're prepared to take each part of your life as it is and run its course then in theory, you know, if you to do a dissertation or every quarter or every year, there you, go. you know, which I guess New Year's resolutions are to a degree, but, you know, you then reassess and you're like, well, okay, what do I learn from that? And it's just growth. You've got to keep on growing, you know. 100%, bro. And you know what you just described, yeah? See, when you talk about New Year's resolutions, yeah, in, in the Western world, yeah, we focus on this New Year and um, this one, one time in the year, one day out of 365 people, take the opportunity to reflect upon decisions that they've made, upon intentions, mm. upon these things. And then they say, "Raw, like, as of tomorrow, I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Yeah. And then tomorrow comes. And then before you know it, like, imagine you wake up one day and you, you, your bus is late. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then mate, Simple he things, past man. and then he splashes you. And before you know it, yeah, you're cursing Screwed. and you're like, you know what? Fuck this. Fuck mm -hmm. that. Da -da -da -da. Mm -hmm. But, are you then going to throw everything out of the window, those intentions that you said and those things that you said, are you going to throw it all out the window or are you going to see those as a test to really test your integrity and to see whether you're willing to go further? And see, in ancient times, yeah, um, in ancient Egypt, they had the ideals of Mart, yeah, which is where we get a lot of um, later influences like Ten Commandments and stuff like that. And they would practice these ideals um, and they would reflect upon them every evening so your day that you took the, the the daily activities that you took then in the evening you would reflect upon your day and say did i did i lie today did i cheat did i steal did i do xyz yeah mm. and there was this almost daily conscious effort to of bettering yourself and yeah. of growing as a human being we do it one day a year in 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 the western world yeah, yeah and in england and we say oh yeah well i, I was gonna do it but fuck it, I'll try next year. Like, can I just can I just intervene though for one second? Because yeah, again, on, just, just relating to the to the, the graffiti side of things, because I have to say, like, what you're saying is right. There's a discipline in that you want to reset every day with a uh, with a Jerry Springer thought and a write down of what you're gonna do tomorrow. But at the same time, just putting in perspective. Okay, you have good days, bad days. What have been the best days? What have been the best moments of this day? For real. You know, and then after a week, you're adding up all your days, and it's great. Um, you graffiti writers, though, you guys now when you're talking about like what might happen and uh, going with the flow, basically, and trying to keep a positive on everything. And you guys, though, you're built like fucking armor. Like you've got muscle 
memory and you just react to shit, it, that shit is, it's like, there's of course extreme examples where you're doing some crazy shit and you're thinking, I nearly died then. <laughs> Equally, there could be some moments where you're like, oh, actually, I didn't die at that point, but I did that before, so I'm going to learn a bit more than that. You know, there's so many variables, but you've got this armour, you've got this wise head on your shoulders, and you're just getting on with it. Um, not a lot of people have that. 100%. Writers are on a different level to that, you know? I think writers are on a different level, but people that go through some real shit in life, because you'll find a lot of writers have been through some real shit. I'm not, I'm not diminishing anybody else's experience, but you will find a common thread between trauma, tragedy, loss, these things, and writers. Do you know what I mean? Because a lot of people learn uh, through the alchemical process of transformation to take that pain and that struggle and that trauma mm. and that violence and that abuse that someone's been subjected to or surrounded with or maybe experienced or just been witness to and they transform that into these beautiful paintings. Like, that's, that's, what, that's what a lot of people don't understand either. And even tags, even hand styles, yeah? In someone's perception and someone's perspective, that may seem dirty, like, with those drips everywhere. And, like, it may seem messy or unclean or something like that. I personally think that, like, a, a billboard with some dead flesh on it um, being marketed at children for a certain corporation with a clown as the face, I think that that's, that's pretty vile, personally, in my personal opinion. But block, 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 people, shut, shut, shut. <laughs> people will see a dirty tag and say, oh, that's disgusting, that's horrible. Imagine, imagine that guy, yeah, may have been going through, yeah, hell in his life, yeah, and hell mm. in his experience. And then when he done that tag, yeah, it may have felt good to him and it may make him feel better because he's transforming that pain. He could do a lot worse with that pain. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of people that do some messed up stuff mm -hmm. due to their pain and due to their trauma, yeah? My man's going out and drawing on stuff and, and doing a tag, yeah? And you're going to hate on that and make out that like that's some massive crime and some massive thing. And it really doesn't, it really, really doesn't weigh How up. How much is um, too much? To, like... How do you mean? Well, again, just, you know, playing devil's advocate and, you know, you, yeah, know, yeah, go you on. know me, I'm the fan. Through and through. It's cool, I've got the armour, let's go. Yeah, on. yeah, okay, cool. So, how much is too much for the public? For the public, at what point is it like, you got to graph everywhere? Like, how, yeah. much, how much is that? How much, and I'm probably asking the wrong person with, with, yeah, yeah. with probably the No, more, no, no, to be honest with you, I'm not... Do um, you know what I'm saying? I'm not ridiculous, do you know what I mean? I'm not, um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not extreme, Okay. Um, but when you take everybody, everybody in the... What I would say is, yeah, is there's a time and a place for everything, yeah? And in my personal opinion, there's certain boundaries and certain lines that I don't cross personally as a writer. And that is places of worship, um, general public, um, you know, like uh, something that you know is someone's hard-earned mm. uh, thing that, that, that mm. is personal to them. Like, mm. I'm not going to go out of my way to mash up something that Dave down the road is is really going to struggle with, yeah? Because that's not me as a person. Like, I'm not taking anything away from people that do, that. that do bomb and that do paint whatever. That's up to them. But me personally, there are certain boundaries and certain lines that I don't cross, yeah? So for me, there's a time and a place for everything. And if it's advertising, if it's like yeah, yeah, science, right. these things, then that's fair game, in my personal opinion. Um, I'm not condoning... Because there's a lot of advertising or, or criminal damage, obviously. But if there is, if there were to be to, to have an honest conversation about this stuff, you would have to say that there are some places that graffiti is borderline acceptable and some places that, in my personal opinion, is unnecessary. Do you know what I mean? I'll say unnecessary because ultimately, I don't believe that I should tell anybody else what to do in this world. I don't want anybody else to tell me what to do in this world. Mm. But at the same time, even coming from like this anarchist perspective, I still got morals. I still got morals. Do you know what I mean? And you'll find that in any organization, like whether you go and chill with anarchists, squatters, like there's still a certain graphers, uh, sophistication, thieves, whoever. There's a certain level yeah. of morals and 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 like um, a certain level of agreement. So for me, I don't mind. I don't mind how much graph is. Uh, around is is around personally, but I do have personal preference on not seeing um, hard-working individuals unnecessarily 
victimized their paces, because yeah. because there's 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 no need for that do you know what i mean like why would i why would i want someone else to struggle unnecessarily like um i don't want that i want people to progress i want people to grow i want the people to be empowered not mm. struggling like mm. no no i feel you i feel you um i ask it because because geo public they love a bit of graph they're very opinionated on graph, but they are they? Very, very opinionated, opinionated yeah. but they don't know nothing about it. So, which is what this, these shows are about. Yeah. So, you know, I want to ask the, the right questions to, to to people that could give a more definitive answer. One thing, ever since I was a kid, and this is just a kind of footnote on the subject, um, because obviously trains are hugely subjective. Yeah. <laughs> right. But when I was a kid, man, and I first ever saw painting on a train. I found it, I thought, it's elated. I was like, I'd lost, first of all, I'd lost my shit. Something bright and colourful pulled up. Secondly, walking into the same car and being inside the art and look, not, not entirely being able to look out the window because you know, because you're proud as punch because you are inside the ride. You're in the dream Yeah, whip. yeah, yeah, for real, for real. There ain't a lot of art which you actually need to experience do you know what i'm saying yeah 100 percent. graph 100%. is graph is an experience that really is dependent on how you have been introduced to it million percent <laughs> million percent i'm saying yeah and you'll find like if you, if you paint like daytime spots um and like tolerated spots yeah you will come across people that i don't know like just just everyday people like you said joe, joe public just walk in their dog or whatever yeah and they'll come past. And if you're doing like a nice piece, they'll stop and they'll be prepared to entertain a conversation with you. And I think that has a lot to do with the surroundings that you're in, the way that you carry yourself um, when you're painting and when you're in, in the public. And all of a sudden, what, become, what was perceived as this negative, intimidating, violent, aggressive thing, mm. all of a sudden becomes a little bit more palatable for the everyday individual because it's now on the canal when they're walking their dog. Do you know what I mean? And they may even stop. And I've, uh, I imagine most writers have encountered mm. people that stop and have a conversation with you when you're mm. painting and say, oh, I like what you're doing. I like the colours, blah, mm. blah, blah, blah. But they would never feel comfortable. Say someone's doing a dub on the street, on a shop shutter with their hood up. Do you know what I mean? On a rainy evening, yeah? they're going to feel that fear and that intimidation. It's the exact same practice. It's the exact same process. But because of the surroundings and because of how it's perceived and because of um, that person's comfort zone, mm. all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more entertainable to have this conversation and to entertain, oh, well, do you know what? Maybe graffiti isn't that bad uh, because that guy that I met down the canal the yeah. other day was, was doing a nice piece. Was doing a nice piece and was uh, was polite and respectful when talking to me. So, mm. again, it's down to personal personal preference and um, a lot of people have these perceptions of graffiti without knowing any writers, without ever experiencing graph, without ever taking time to understand graph. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And when you do understand graph and when you do meet a writer, you've got to be a pretty... You've got to be a pretty miserable person, yeah, to, to, to not dig it. Exactly. And to not even, and, and not even, I'm not even saying co-sign it. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying come out, paint, da 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 but at least just just show that little bit of love and that bit of respect. It's funny because I when when you put it like that, and again, just from a, somebody that doesn't graph, but is, is you know, take, doing, get, getting notes as I go, it's like, yo, like there's two parallels that are going on here that from a, from a, quote unquote uh creative point of view and from a marketing quote unquote point of view. Yeah, yeah. And I sound it sounds crass and I sound like a knob, but you get what I'm saying. I I know that to perfect your piece, you've got to perfect your tag. There's the three levels of process that you've yeah, got to man. go through. That's gonna be crass to begin with and get better with time. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, you've almost got to reverse that from the public from a public eye point of view, whereby you have to be really good at doing the piece first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then break and it be down. super approachable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear and you. be in a public place where you can wave a fucking 
you know, auntie and say, yeah, yeah, cool, yeah, nice, cool, I got my mask on, nice to meet you, kind yeah, of yeah, shit. Yeah, 100%. And then reverse it and go mad at night. It's like such a weird kind of, uh, it's back to front, but they've both got to be, I guess they both got to be parallel at the same time. If Definitely. you can master your, your skill set and be out there and prominent. Definitely, bro. And you're never going to get, um, you're n uh, nobody's ever going to like everything. Do you know what I mean? And that's, that's one of the beauties of humanity is that no one's ever going to be the same. Um, so no two people are ever, even when you look at art, bro, even when you look at a piece, yeah, you don't actually see the exact same piece that the writer created. Do you know what I mean? Because as mm. a writer, we don't necessarily look at like one element of the piece or one, uh, or, or one big picture of the piece. Yeah. We look at the layers, the colors, the mm. fades, the cutbacks, the shines, the highlights, like the shadow, the border, these things there. That's 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 what we focus on, yeah. <laughs> Whereas right. when when someone from um, outside of the art form or, or outside of being a writer looks at it, they just see that word. Do you know what I mean? And just see that piece, um, mm. unless they're in the known, unless they've taken time to understand mm. like the layers that go into creating a piece and stuff like that. So again, it's all down to. Um, people's personal preference and people's personal perceptions on graph and nobody's ever going to love it. Um, not, not everybody's going to love it. Not everybody's going to hate it. Um, but one thing that I do think is worth having a conversation about is the criminalization of it and the criminalization of this art form, because there is not another art form that is revolutionary like graffiti. And when I say revolutionary, like I, I use that word, um, wholeheartedly because to be a revolutionary is to challenge the status quo and to challenge normality and reality um, and there are many different ways of doing that like um, there are many different types of revolutionaries and different types of revolution hmm. however the the fo the art form of graph is the most revolutionary art form because okay, I agree there is not another group of individuals that in the art world that pay the price of going to prison and going to jail for their artwork. Like, and that is what separates graphers and writers from every other type of artist because they are prepared to pay the ultimate price and make that sacrifice of their freedom mm. and even further, one step further, their life. Like you were saying earlier um, about like near death experiences and stuff like that. And as a writer, them things become normal for want of a better word yeah like every that. single day whether whether it's right or not yeah because it's criminalized every single day that you get up as a writer and you go out and paint you know you are ultimately facing going to jail for what is you're your doing is your paint worth more than your life how do you mean is your name and your piece and the way you write worth more than your life is um are you, me personally? Yeah, in general, um, maybe you more so because obviously no one's else. Do you know what? They go hand in hand, yeah, because I think once you take um, the decision, <clears throat> once you take the decision to be a writer, mm. then there's no turning back, like, because once you've got a criminal record, you've then got that for life. Do you know what I mean? Once you've ostracized yourself from certain members of, family or society friends or friends shit, yeah. and stuff like that. There's no turning back, do you know what I mean? So once you go down that path, it is a path for life for most individuals. Some people step away from it and that's up to them. But the deaf, the near death side of it, um, it, it literally goes hand in hand because if you're going out and painting train lines, painting trains, hmm. painting motorways, um, stuff like that, you ultimately know one one slip and one mistake or one fuck up and game you're over. done. Do you know what I mean? No, this ain't a computer game. This ain't GTA. You don't get a second life. Do you know what I mean? Like whether you do in the physical, spiritual sense of the conversation for another day. However, in this physical body, you only get one experience um, hmm. and you only get one experience. So if you fuck up or you make a mistake when you're painting or you're writing, that's it. I game think, over. I think from a, a Joe Public point of view, I think, and again, we've got this Joe Public thing, but I, I'm, you know, I, I do feel like there's some conversations that can be had, which, you know, obviously it's not everyone's opinion, but I feel like without question, 
there is no doubt in anyone's mind that when they see a risky reach or they see a train beat that's been done however long ago or they see a trackside. Again, we're talking in retrospect but with anything to do with this, but, yo, there's no question that that was dangerous. I'll take your hat, my hat off to that. 100%, 100%. Because people know that there's, there's a huge risk element to all of it. Like, and even if they don't um, acknowledge or respect it, yeah, they are inquisitive about it. And that again, and questions like, that like, again yeah. is a big part of this because the broken window theory yeah. is a big part of why graffiti is outlawed and why graffiti is criminalised. Because Explain the broken window theory. For society people. has this perception that if you see a broken window in a building, then it indicates that that building is not cared about or that that building is neglected and that that building is not taken care of. That then encourages, allegedly, other individuals to not care and to um, to treat the place with disrespect and then break more windows. So the broken window theory is that by having one broken window, it encourages other people to break other windows. The, the metaphor is that graffiti is a broken window and that by having one piece of graffiti, you then encourage other pieces of graffiti. However, I, I understand why this theory exists, but for me personally, I would like to scratch a little bit deeper like at this conversation and at this topic and say, okay, cool. So there may well be a broken window there and there may well be graffiti there. We'll refer to it as a broken window or entertain the idea. However, what led to the creation of that broken window? What, what, what led to that creation? Let's have that conversation because yeah, okay, great. We know graffiti exists. We know people break windows. Let's talk about why graffiti exists. Let's talk about why that individual felt that they wanted to do that, whether it's smashing the window or whether it's writing their name mm. on something. Let's have that conversation because we don't seem to want to have those conversations as to why crimes, if you want to refer to them as crimes, exist. Do you know what I mean? Mm. People just want to look at the... Uh, the result rather the than... Result the result rather than the cause. Mm. And if we do have an open, honest conversation about the causes of poverty, of crime, it's an uncomfortable conversation for a lot of individuals. And a lot so, of people don't know that those individuals don't actually do anything about it. There you go. They just and keep up with the narrative of the broken window and, the, you know... And there you go. And, and the, the general public that don't often have the time or the energy to look deeper and to think deeper into things, they're... Mm. They just go along with it, do you know what I mean? Because people haven't got the energy and the time every day to sit there and dissect everything that the system says and everything that the elite mainstream narrative is because they're, they're, they're working hard to pay their bills. People are on the poverty line. They're trying to uh, feed their children, do you know what I mean? And, this and it's again, only getting worse. And this, again, is how a lot of society's fuckery, for want of a better word, manages to keep existing because they just keep people struggling and fighting amongst themselves so that... Um, it's the, it's the yeah, age-old yeah, yeah, tactic yeah, yeah. of divide and conquer, you all know? Day, all day. And the more you can keep people divided yeah. and squabbling, the less likely they are. Um, like, animal farm, perfect ideology, yeah? You, you've got, <laughs> like, you've got the farmer living nice in the house, yeah? Like, big belly, eating good, slaughtering the animals and that. And then he's treating the animals like shit, do you know what I mean? Mm. And benefiting from the horse doing the work and slaughtering the cows and the pigs and all of this. And then one day... The animals realise, hang on a minute, do you know what? We're being, we're being taken the piss out of here. And then the animals rise up and the animals take their freedom back. But then, as I'm sure you know if you know the story, there is a small group of animals which take power from the animals and they say, hang on a minute, we know what's best for society and we know what's best for you, mm. so we'll make the decisions for you. And again, you can just see this whole thing play out, in our, the fuck out. in our situation, in our... In our reality. And that's why I say that graffiti is the most revolutionary thing because it challenges all of this. And mm. even with the internet censored, with TV controlled by all of these um, individuals and all of these corporations, graffiti, you can go out there and write your message tomorrow on a wall and whether people like it or not, they have to read it. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. That is a big problem. It's a big problem for them, isn't it? For 100%, man. 100%. Yeah. And that is, again, why I think that me personally... As I'm sure you've seen, I choose to use my art and to paint my graph alongside real real messages and, mm. and things to make people think. And we were talking about like um, ancient Egypt earlier. Like a lot of my art and a lot of my work here yeah, is influenced by ancient art. Do you know what I mean? Like we are, put it this way, yeah? 
in ancient times, people were painting hieroglyphics and scribes were uh, carving hieroglyphics into the walls, yeah? Mm -hmm. We are the modern day uh, scribes. Like, whether yeah. people like it or not, whether people are prepared to accept it or not, we are the modern version of the scribes because we are documenting our emotions, our feelings, the current situation and times on the walls. And, and the lives, the lives and times, you know. They're, they're, that's important. When you think about how many voices get heard in, in graph, like you were saying earlier about the, you know, the, using that emotion and the throwing it out on the wall as like this massive, colourful piece, you know. It, they, that, it's a, it is a protest, but it's, it's one that's... It, it, it's with intention. 100% bro, and to talk about protest, like protest, um, activism, graffiti, all this stuff goes hand yeah. in hand. Like for me, um, um, I, have, I have had first-hand experience of what it's like to be a part of a revolution and surrounded by art and revolutionary activism. Um, 2012, I was in Egypt uh, during the revolution and I was there literally as everything was absolutely crazy. Like the government had been overthrown. There was no government at the time. And it was literally like, if you look back at the videos and the footage of the times, it was, there was millions of people in the streets. Mm. Literally, it was insane in Tahir Square. And the people had had enough of the corruption and of the injustice. And one of the biggest triggers that triggered uh, this mass uprising was when the government flicked the kill switch on the internet. And as soon as people couldn't access the internet it went down. and they killed freedom of speech and they killed all the social networks, bam, that was it. Everyone was out in the streets. And I was... I bet graffiti went up too. This is what I was going to say. All of the... Um, all of the people used to communicate because there wasn't social media mm. and there wasn't the ability to communicate on the internet, yeah? Mm. The protesters would communicate by writing on the walls and they would write, tonight, we're linking here, da 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 like, and Mad. all of a sudden, this ancient art form had come back into play, do you know what I mean? Because people used to write political stuff back in the day, not even ancient times, but Free Nelson Mandela, Free Palestine, stuff like this, like, people mm. have always used, graffiti has always been the chosen medium of challenging society and challenging injustice mm -hmm. and in Egypt during the revolution there was graffiti everywhere and for me personally it was beautiful because it was so different to the graph that I'd seen here um, and to be surrounded by pure Arabic graffiti and pure like political graffiti like it was so different Crazy. to what I'd experienced here mm -hmm. and to be there amongst these brothers and amongst this protest and seeing firsthand like wow like this is these people like are dying and these people mm -hmm. are dying in these protests and people are getting shot and the, the police Crazy. and the army yeah, are killing yeah, people wow. and, and they're paying the ultimate price, yeah? And graffiti was working hand in hand with that. Do you know what I mean? Because mm. all of a sudden, the internet and phones and stuff like that wasn't mm. uh, the chosen method of communication. And graffiti played a huge part in that. Um, as when I went uh, to Palestine as well, I spent some time in Gaza. Um, I took aid there to the women and children there. And I was part of a charity organization that we collected a load of aid in Egypt. This is during the revolution, so mm -hmm. things were really crazy. And we spent about a month traveling all the way through Egypt. We were sleeping on like bus floors, slept in the desert. Like literally, it was a, it was a full, full mission, yeah? Wow. Um, and like sleeping under the stars and that. Like it was, it was the most intense experience of my life because of everything that was attached to it, because of the unstable climate that I was in, of the intentions of helping, being surrounded by graph and all this unpredictability and being in like a different country and everything being just that little bit different. Mm. And then when, when we crossed the border and we uh, crossed through Rafa and we entered into Gaza, it was like a whole new world as well. Like Egypt was something and Egypt during the revolution was something. But when you enter into Gaza, you're going into a war zone and Gaza is a war zone and has been uh. occupied um, and under siege for over 60 years. So... When I arrived in Gaza, all of the graffiti changed as well and all of the graph changed and it was a lot more militant. Like, um, I don't know whether you've ever seen, um, I'm from Irish family, yeah? So Belfast has got a lot of militant murals, yeah? And you've got a lot of like guys with balaclavas, AK-47s, like, mm -hmm. and it's, it's there to send a message, do you know what I mean? Don't fuck around. In yeah. this neighborhood, 
we don't fuck around. Do you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? And you will see... That's a whole nother... You will see people still patrolling the streets and people, um, paramilitaries in Ireland, still patrolling Didn't the streets really and stuff. In the evenings and stuff like that, there are still people that will hot you up if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, really? And wow. Because the neighbourhoods wow. are still separated. Like Even yeah. in Northern Ireland now, the Catholic and the Protestant neighbourhoods are still separated and you have separation walls... There are huge parallels between and that's the situations. The graph is. That's where you see the graph on the blocks. Hundred percent on the blocks, and also to warn you of like what neighborhood. Like you'll see on the lamppost and flags as well. Flags plays a huge part in it because yeah. whatever neighborhood you're in will either either fly a Republican uh, Irish flag or a British flag, and you'll know then. Like you shouldn't really be in this area if you're aligned with Mate. another thing, and it's exactly the same in Gaza. Like all of the graffiti was militant. Um, and all of the messages were to do with resistance, to do with power to the people, to never surrender. Like all of a sudden, there was no, there was no graffiti that was just the odd name. Do you know what I mean? Like everything had a real, a real message to it and a real power to it. And that was the first time. So I, was that anonymous? But people were putting them a message through. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And it was literally the oh. the message was, be strong, um, don't surrender. Um, like resist and when when I started to communicate and meet some of the people from Gaza and uh, meet some of the families and stuff yeah. all of the children that I met yeah if you ask them what do you want to be when you're older because of the experiences that they've got and living under occupation and you've got armed drones flying over your head every day and dropping bombs and gunshots going off every day these children know nothing else yeah apart from war and they've been uh, born into war and all of their all of their responses were, I want to be a doctor so that I can heal hmm. and save people. I want to be a lawyer so that I can get justice for my family or for uh, my people. Or I want to be a uh, resistance. I want to be a soldier um, to defend That's and it. to do this. And everywhere that you go in the neighborhoods, there's big paintings on the sides of the houses of people that have been martyred. Do you know what I mean? So if, if a family has lost um, a oh, son yeah, yeah, yeah. or a brother or an uncle, that that person is immortalized on the side of the house with a beautiful photorealistic uh, painting. And you see the same in Ireland as well. Like the parallels between Ireland and Palestine are two and the same. But I guess this is a representation of what happens when people are a victim of injustice and occupation. It doesn't matter whether you're living in the Western world or whether you're living in the Middle East um, because injustice and oppression affects people in the same ways. Yeah, do you know yeah. what I mean? And it yeah. breeds the same it breeds the same kind of responses. And hatred and violence breeds hatred and violence. And it takes a, like we were talking earlier, it takes a very powerful individual to be exposed to extreme violence, extreme hate, extreme oppression, and then raise their vibration and raise their consciousness above that so that you get past yeah, beyond yeah, retaliation yeah, yeah. and you start to embody what? Compassion, mm. forgiveness, understanding, uh, logical and rational thinking. Like, and don't get me wrong, I'm not taking anything away from anybody that that um, feels um, for retaliation in the in the case of injustice. However, what I'm saying is that the individuals that really make change and the individuals that really change society, they're the individuals that seem to go past that. Again, Malcolm X, perfect example. He was preaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he was preaching a message of division mm. at one point when he was aligned with Nation of Islam and Elijah Muhammad and so forth. And then he traveled to Mecca. And when he traveled to Mecca, he wrote a letter, um, I believe, to someone back home. And he said, since I've traveled to Mecca, I've seen people of all color um, praying together, mm. uh, white people, black people. And obviously living mm. in America at the time, the there was huge yeah. uh, separation Frictioner, and huge, yeah. huge problems in the injustice of society. Yeah. So all of a sudden, Malcolm X had gone from seeing one, one individual as his enemy to seeing that individual as his brother. And this was the most militant don. Do you know mm. what I mean? This, was, yeah, this yeah. is Malcolm X posted up by the window with his AK yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden, his consciousness shifts into this, into this next reality. And obviously, he probably still was very militant, but he embodied this compassion. And then when he came back and started to preach compassion and understanding and that we can actually make changes by working together. Mm. What happened to him? Go on. Malcolm X was assassinated. And that's what happens to people that have this kind of raising of... Tupac. Tupac as well. Exactly the same thing. And we have individuals in this country as well 
Rest in peace, Samson, Black the Ripper, my brother. Um, one of yeah, the realists. Yeah, Black the Ripper. Um, like, he was one of the realists in this country. Um, and he was a big part of the revolutionary movement. And yeah, uh, his, mo his music and his, um, his movement will be immortalized now. Yeah. And his music will always serve if you go back and listen to some of his songs that he did with mm. Low Key, Hold Tight Low Key Hold as well, Loki. my brother. I mean, these are OGs um, here. 100%. And do you know what? Kobe Bryant. Do you Go think on. same thing? Do you think to a certain to a certain degree? Again, it's another person similar to Malcolm X, similar to Tupac, similar to all these people that we've talked about. It's like raises to a certain vibration. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, oh, where'd they go? When it comes to this conversation, and it comes to celebrities, I mean, without getting conspiracy like that, theorists, a little we bit. could we could delve into all kinds of different directions. Um, however, what I'll say is, yeah, there's a line in one of. Um, uh, text tunes, whole tight immortal technique as well, another oh, revolutionary wow, soldier. Wow. Um, and he says, if if the devil wants to dance, then you better say never, because a dance with the devil might last you forever. So I'll leave I'll leave that open to interpretation and I'll leave that for people to take from that what they will. However, there does seem to be um, some merit and some indication that when choosing a certain path in life, you often encounter um, you often encounter not not so much of a happy ending to mm. the story, you know. Mm. Um, and again, to 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 take it back to the idea of graffiti and graph writers and this revolutionary mindset is graph writers have already accepted the worst case scenario, because the worst case scenario in this physical experience is to die, is to experience death. Yeah. And if you've already, um, if you've already overcome that fear yeah. and you've already stared death in the face, um, which a lot of graffiti writers have. The more have, you got like, to lose. So many different examples. Like just in my personal experience, I'll give you, I'll give you one little story now. Um, and this is a story from Gaza. Um, when I went out to Gaza, a lot of the man them here knew that I was going and supported me. We're talking now like 10 years ago. Yeah, 2000, just about 10 years ago. Mm. And the man them were very, very, very supportive of me choosing to do what I was doing and to do the charity movement and to, to help the people um, in the way that I was. And hold tight, chrome and black, yeah, because they give me my paint, yeah. And I said to them before I was going, I was like, look, I'm going to Gaza, yeah. And like, um, I'm going to do charity work and I'm mm. going to help the people. And they were like, cool, like, the man them, they give me some t-shirts, uh, they give me some garments, they give me some hoodies and stuff. And they're like, just give them to anyone out there. Do you know what I mean? Like give them to the kids out there. Because yeah. I said, obviously, man's going to refugee camps. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. To, to help the people, yeah? And they were like, here's, here's some garments, yeah? yeah? Just give them to the people, innit? Like, mm. hold tight, my man. They know who they are. They, they were there and they gave me a nice collection of garments to give to people. Akala as well, my brother, I've got to give it to him. He gave me... Bear CDs, he gave me the Ill Estate tees, you know, the ones with the Jamaican... Yeah, yeah, not um, like Carla, come on. He's got the Union Jack, but in the Jamaican yeah. colours. He gave me Bear and MTs, he was like, bro, he was like, just give out my CDs and my tees to anybody out there. Like, he was like, I just want you to give them, I just want people to be... Feel, feel to have love. my music and, yeah. to, and to know that someone cared, innit? And I was like, thank you. And literally, I was inundated with man them, like, you're talking very serious, real road guys, all saying to me, Caps, here's something to to give to the Palestinians, to help the people. Do you know what I mean? And people were literally giving me everything, bro. From Crazy. Clothes, art supplies, paint, everything. So, one night, yeah, um, I'm staying in Gaza City um, and Gaza in itself is a very, very, very intense place and you never quite feel, for the whole time that I was there, you can never relax and you can never... Do you want edge a lot? On edge, hundred percent, because Bet. you've got you've got bombs going off, you've got the crackle of gunfire in the background. You know that at any moment. Okay, let me put this into perspective. Yeah, Gaza is about the size of the Isle of Wight. Yeah, in size. Yeah, it's tiny, tiny piece of land. Yeah, it's got a sea on one side with uh, navy ships all pointing their guns at it. It's got a wall on the other side blocking uh, the Palestinians yeah. from leaving yeah. and entering into other territories, and then. They've got a no-fly zone over Gaza, yeah? So what that means is no planes are allowed to fly over Gaza, yeah? Mm -hmm. The only planes that you see in the sky, yeah, you know are military... Um, Bomb droppers. Occupiers' um, planes. And you know that anytime you see a red light in the sky, either a, a drone 
or F-16 fighter jet. And you know that you could be you could be killed at any moment. Like so here here we are Boy. walking around. And this was another thing. What's that for like me. to be there? Like the, to, to even like you say, I mean emotionally it was like you were on um, edge. To a lot. certain extent, it was very, very hard. In the moment, in the time, for the whole time that I was on this mission, yeah, I never really showed any emotion and I never really entertained emotions because when you're in an intense experience yeah. and when you're in a very dangerous experience, your emotions can cloud your vision. So it's very important to maintain a cool head in in a dangerous experience and in a survival situation. Mm -hmm. So the whole time that I was um, exposed to this, I didn't react didn't, emotionally. Didn't, yeah, yeah? Okay. I just dealt with the immediate here and now mm. situations of have I got food, have I got water, have I got shelter, am I safe in this immediate moment? Um, and you, you just train your brain to to survive and to think in um, that existence is your main priority. Ooh. So this night, I've decided, yeah, that I was gonna that I was gonna sneak away from where I was staying and I was gonna go and paint because I'd taken paint out there, yeah, and I wasn't gonna go all the way to Gaza, yeah, and help the people there and do what I was doing there, yeah, and not paint because obviously. Painting is such a big part of who I am. Like regardless mm. of like politics, activism, stuff like that, painting is a huge part of where of who I am, where I've come Mad. from. So <laughs> I've decided this night, yeah, I'm going out. And oh, I've shit. I've got my boy, my boy, <laughs> rest in peace, my brother. I said to him, I was like, listen, yeah, I need like one hour, yeah? Just cover for me for one hour, yeah, and then I'll be back. And he was like, man, you're crazy. And I was like, listen, I know exactly what I'm doing, yeah? I'm going to cut down this road. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to cut around the back of the camp. And then I'm going to do a piece on this wall. And he was like, bro, you're crazy, man. He was like, may God be with you. He was like, and if anything happens, he was like, I'm denying all um, knowledge and all responsibility of what you were doing. And I was like, all right, cool. Bro, you fucking painted Gaza. 100% man, come on. So <laughs> then I've said to Sumbal, I was like, right, I'm gone. And I had some friends uh, in Palestine already and I'd made good friends already, yeah? And I contacted one of my friends and I was like, look, because um, I didn't know quite where I was going. I styled it out telling my mate that I did, but I didn't know quite where I was going. So I called my mate and I was like, look, can you show me the way to this building? Because I'd already seen it in the daytime, yeah, and it was a nice roadside spot. And I was oh, like, listen, shit. yeah, I want to do a dub there, yeah? <laughs> so I've called my friend and they were like, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. So my friends come and met me and I've creeped around the back of this area to this point. And there wasn't too many cars, yeah, so it was all right because it was nighttime, yeah, and one thing in Gaza in the nighttime, traffic dies down, things get very quiet, and that's when a lot of the air raids and stuff happen. So I'm, like, looking out, and I'm, like, lining up my piece and stuff, like, and these cars gone past, like, two, three cars, and I said, I was like, do you think it's all right? Like, like something, like, my heart's beating, do you know what I mean? Like, that, that buzz that you get from painting is enough, let alone painting with, like, armed drones flying over your head and gunshots in the distance and literally I've said to my friend I was like you think it's all right and they're like yeah 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 don't worry man it's cool it's cool it's cool I was like all right cool I've carried on I've started lining up a big free Gaza piece yeah because I thought if I'm going to paint something in Gaza yeah I'm going to paint something real do you know what I mean I'm going to paint something decent oh, so I've started painting it yeah Sh thinking back yeah I should have just done like a one color fill or something like that or a zigzag dub yeah but I was going all out, yeah. So I've done like the Palestinian flag as the colors and like I'm doing a proper fill and that. And I'm halfway through my fill and then this four by four screeches up next to me, yeah. And I was like, shit. Because the people that um, run Gaza and the people that are in the government that are in charge of Gaza are a very, shall we say, militant um, organization. So my man jumped out of this four by four, yeah. Full camouflage fatigues, big beard, big assault rifle. Literally. Can I just break at this point? You better not tell me to edit this shit. <laughs> nah, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. So my guy jumps out of the car, starts shouting at me, and he's shouting at me um, in Arabic, and I'm understanding tiny little bits of what he says. And literally, uh, my heart, yeah, at this point is racing, yeah, because I thought, no way, like I'm, I'm about to either get shot or arrested in the Gaza Strip, yeah. Um, and next thing, my friend, yeah, this is, this is why I, I know that someone's watching over me that day. My friend, yeah, steps in front of me and this brother with the gun and starts to talk to him in Arabic. And I was like, thank God for this, yeah. And then the next thing, 
How did what the conversation said, what would you have said? This is this is what I found out afterwards. Yeah. So the conversation kind of went, "What are you doing? Why is there a white guy painting graffiti?" And then my friend explains, "Look, my friend's an activist. They've come here doing charity work, and he's actually painting something for Palestine in like uh, solidarity." Oh, because they um, can't read the... Because he couldn't read the writing either. Because because I'm writing in English, yeah? I'm writing a big free Gaza, yeah, in English on the side of the road in Gaza, yeah? And so they've explained to my man what's going on, yeah? And my man's still screwing, yeah? Still screwing. And then my friend starts screwing back and I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, don't argue. Like, the guy's got a big gun, yeah? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. the last thing we You're need. looking at it for a real... 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, no, like, this is, this is really going the wrong way. We're both about to get nicked, yeah? <laughs> And then they start arguing again and they start arguing backwards and forwards. And I'm thinking, why are you arguing with my man? Yeah, and it's then, clearly a one man up shit, shit going on here. The guy turns around and he was like, Halas, okay, like, finish, get out of here. And I was like, but like my outline, man, like I haven't even finished my outline. Like, and my friend's looking at me like, are you mad? Like, you, yeah. you've just been yeah. told, yeah, like, get out of here. And you care about finishing your outline. And I was like, Please, let me just finish my outline. And the guy is shaking his head at me, yeah? So I've literally just done my outline like that. And then me and my friend of Dust literally, like, cut You did it while he was watching? Yeah, yeah, literally finished what my did outline. They say? And he's just stood there shaking his head like that. We've cut out of there and literally cut down the back roads. My heart was beating more than it's ever beaten. I was, like, feeling, like, real worry and real anxiety. Did you get like, flicks? Shit. Yeah, yeah, I've got a flick of it. Um, and then I said to my friend, I was like, what did you say that, like like defuse the situation like what was it at that point when you were shouting and arguing what was it that you said like basically he asked what my name was and when I said my family name it turns out that he's like my second cousin and I was like no way because uh, a lot of the families and a lot of the people in uh, Gaza are all related uh, because it's a very small area so my man's turned around and said <laughs> I'm your cousin yeah what? And you're bringing shame on the family by doing this now. And explained, like, look. Just by guy, luck. Yeah, just pure. Well, luck is one thing. Synchronicity is another. So my man turned around and said, look, you're disrespecting me with family. Allow me, basically. And my man said, take your friend and get the fuck out of here, basically. And then, yeah, we cut back to where I was staying. I got back in. Um, like, I was, I was literally shaking, man. Like, I was proper shaking. Um... And my friend said to me, he was like, did you paint? Did you paint? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, did you get caught? And I was like, mm, kind of, kind of. And he was like, bro, you are insane. And I was like, but at least I've done it. I was like, and at least now the piece is there and I'm happy. And he was like, I've got to give it to you, man. He was like, the, the love that you have for your graph and for your art. Yeah, he was like, it's beautiful, man. He was like, and the fact that you chose to dedicate that piece uh, to Palestine and to the Gazans, he said, it, it, it just speaks volume um, about this graph thing and about what you're doing. And I was like, thank you, man. So, yeah, bro, that was a very, 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 very dangerous experience to do with graph, to do with this whole lifestyle, man. I would argue that this is probably the most hardcore graph story I've heard ever. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's others out there that I could proclaim. You get on here and tell that story like that in your way. I've never heard anything like that to this day. That's cold. That's cold. That's putting money where your mouth is. Respect, my brother. Respect, man. Concrete respect, man. Yeah. Now I'm starting to think. Once you once you've experienced that, the there really are no limit. It's limitless. That's it. And that's I think that maybe I should have uh, told that story earlier in the conversation because a lot of my mentality and a lot of my way of thinking has been shaped by the intensity and of the extremities that. of my experiences in my life, and especially Egypt during the revolution and experiencing Gaza as well. Like, and um, some other places and some other experiences that I've had um, have definitely played a huge part in why my mind is the way that it is and the way that I think that, that I do. So, yeah, it, it all comes from graph. Like, the reason that I even ended up uh, travelling to Egypt... And Palestine was through graph as well. It all started with me and one of my very, very, very good brothers being asked to paint a truck. And we painted the truck. And then a few months later, I was on a plane to Gaza. Like, well, to Egypt, headed to Gaza. Um, wow. So, yeah, but that's, 
these are, these were all uh, shifts in consciousness for me. Like these times, my consciousness was expanding to next levels, and I started to understand the signs, synchronicity, the law of attraction, um, these things, and how yeah. how your mind yeah. and what you think creates your reality. Or if it doesn't create it, influences. Mm. We can say influences, mm. yeah? So I learned very quickly, if you think in a negative way and if you think in a fearful way and if you think constantly in a lower vibrational way, yeah. you are going to attract that into your experience. You're going to attract fear. Yeah, 100%. Um, these things. If you resonate that light and you raise your vibration mm. yeah, to the point where you are literally... Where you're lit, do you know what I mean? So yeah. that when you when you walk into the room, people are like, "Whoa!" Like, I yeah. felt that I felt that shift in energy. Boom, do you know what I mean? It, but yeah. not in a negative way, because you know, you can get a dodgy vibe from people. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, um, when someone walks in a room or something, you can know, oh yeah, that that's that, that smell of shit around here. Exactly. Like, you feel I know it. that vibe's not right. And on the flip side of it, when you do that inner work and when you start to work on yourself and grow um, consciously you very quickly realize that what we perceive to be reality and what we've been told is reality, yeah, the rules are flexible, my G. Like, mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, like, you know, like in the Matrix, yeah, like Neo, when, when all of a sudden he realizes, like, he's fighting, he's fighting Morpheus and, like, Morpheus has punched him up, yeah, like, proper batted him up and then he's sitting there wheezing, like, because he's been, he's mm -hmm. been batted up and then Morpheus says to him, he's like, What's wrong with you? And Neo's like, oh, like, I'm out of breath. And he's like, what? Do you think that's air that you're breathing? And then all of a sudden, he realizes he's like, rah, I'm in the matrix. I don't, need, I don't even need air. I don't even need to breathe. And again, like this movie, um, there are huge, um, mm -hmm. huge underlying messages and huge underlying um, It's more than one word, shall we say. 100%. <laughs> that basically... If you are open-minded and if you are open to uh, learning, then there are some fantastic ideas contained within that story and within that film that they actually apply to our reality and to our perception. Just like. to rewind it a little bit, because you you, we did kind of steer into stereotypes and stuff like that. Yeah, sure, go for it, man. Yeah, so... I mean, man, I mean, the stereotype of a graph writer. The stereotype of anything, you know what I mean? Physical demeanor, the the the, the impression, the first impression of a person when they walk in a room, or the first impression. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes the impression of a graffiti piece, and when you meet the person, these are two different kind of lanes. It's like, wow, this looks really aggressive and in the most craziest of places with the craziest colors. But then there's this timid character that that you know may not say boo to a goose. There's also, I mean, man, you know, God, <laughs> skinhead era. You know, the mm -hmm. stereotype of a skinhead. Real skinheads as well. We're talking about the real skinheads. I'm talking about, I'm actually probably talking more about the everyday Joe who happens to walk into a, into a fucking pub yeah, and, yeah. and looks like he, he's, he's a member of madness for a second. Yeah, yeah. And people are intimidated by him, but, but that stereotype lives with them. For forever, hundred percent, and people with tattoos. Do you know what I mean? People yeah, yeah with all of that. Like, how do you break? How does a person break down that stereotype of themselves and make it more uh, and make their life more uh, malleable? Because what we're talking about here, I mean, you mean, I know there's a stereotype of me. I know there's a stereotype of you. We can't change those stereotypes, but I guess I suppose it's about knowing the enemy. And what people perceive you as first. 100%. And I think, yeah, that when you uh, reach a certain level of uh, knowledge of self. Age as well. Age as well. You become, for want of a better word, indifferent to other people's uh, Ooh, perceptions yeah. Yeah. and interpretations of you. Because if you truly know yourself as an individual... It doesn't matter what anyone else says about mm. you or what anyone else thinks about you because you are only accountable to you, to you yeah. and whatever you believe in. Um, that's all you are accountable to. And I think personally, when I was younger, I was I was judgmental. I was judgmental over people and mm. I would choose to not associate or not socialise with certain people because they weren't of my, um, shall we say, like friendship circle or what I thought or perceived to be cool and acceptable. Mm. Whereas now I've learned that like 
some of the powerful, some of the most powerful knowledge and lessons that I've learned in life and contributions that I've had in my experience have come from some of the most unexpected individuals. Mm. Does that make sense? So it's about broadening the mind. There you go. And it's about the people that are stereotyped not to feel so stereotyped. There you go. And, and again, what the when flies? you own yourself and when you own who you are, if you're confident with it, boom, no one can tell you shit. shit. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that, that is a problem for some people, but I personally believe that the only people that would ever find a fault in someone else or in how someone else is, is if they've got a fault within themselves and it's really an internal struggle mm. that they're projecting onto the other individual. Yeah. And you've got to be ready to anal analyze that as a um as a person that's being received which there you is go. receiving that. There you go. Rather than being emotionally yeah. um, attached to that yeah. and then responding in kind. That's the shit's the toughest thing ever. Do you know what I mean? Killing with kindness is so tough. Hundred percent, bro. Hundred percent. But man. you know that's the it's the it's the biggest. It comes with the biggest rewards. It takes the biggest bravery. But then it gets gains the best rewards. Definitely, hundred percent, man. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we are here. It's on this. <laughs> yeah, we are, we're good to roll this up, mate. It's all good, man. It's but all I'm good. telling you, this is some cold behaviour. It's you've you you've taken me to a whole nother walks in this one. That's what I'm about, bro. Reese warned me about, about this one. This one's going to be fire. This one's going to be flames to jump. Big shout one, T. Big shout, TDO, TKS. Come on, get, roll them out. Roll them out. Tell them what's good. Do you know what, yeah? I'm not even going to name names, yeah, because I don't want to be that guy that mentions so and so and so and so. But what I will say is, yeah, big respect to everybody that has known me on this journey from, from way back right up until now whether they're people that I first started painting with, whether they're people that inspired me when I was young, whether they're people that I now are solidly with and my family tree. Mm. Respect to everyone. Um, and thank you for the contributions that you've made in my experience because together we've made an amazing experience and my mm. life has been um, a very interesting and very enjoyable experience and I'm thankful for that and I'm eternally grateful for the individuals that took me under their wing. Um, you've mentioned some of them. The individuals that took me under their wing and said, you know what, mm. where a lot of other people saw a problem and a lot of other people saw, you know, like a little bit of a loose cannon or a, mm. little, bit, a little bit too militant, a little bit too much, mm. yeah? There were certain individuals that were like, nah, I get it mm. and I get him. And you know what, let's do this mm. and together, we've created a formidable force. For um, real. And now we're going down all kinds of different directions. Um, a lot of the people in my personal experience are making the transition from being just a writer to empowering themselves with their uh, craft to be empowered and do business side of it, whether that be the workshops that mm. we do because we do workshops in the community, we do commissions, um, we've got T-shirts, we've got clothing, we've got magazines, we've got DVDs, we've mm. got... Everything, all around this, covering all ends of the spectrum. And I personally am very humbled and very thankful to be a part of such a special movement. Um, and like I said, it is one of the most special movements in history. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing now, in 50 years, in 100 years time, yeah, what we're doing now will be viewed very differently, I guarantee. Yeah, I like, feel that. Because in, in the moment, any controversial movement in history always encounters a lot of resistance, resistance at the start. Too true. However, Real. eventually, society realises, do you know what, this has a place and it actually has something to mm. benefit and mm. something to bring to us. And I firmly believe, look at the transition that Graf has made in 10 years. Like, look where it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like I was saying to my boy the other day, I don't know where it was 10 or, yeah, about 15 years ago, 56k dial-up, like when you could only use the... Um, you couldn't use the phone when someone was on the internet. There was only like two graph forums for like uh, yeah, pieces yeah. and you could only go on there and you'd like see these, all the different crews would upload like a stack mm. full of their photos and stuff like. And now you've got Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, people doing live videos of graph and stuff like yeah, that. So podcast, hold tight. That's what I'm saying, man. And the direction that this is going in is a fantastic direction. And I just want to encourage everyone out there. I want to encourage every writer to keep doing what you're doing. Um, to empower yourself, to believe in yourself mm. and to just preserve our, our art form and our movement um, as best as we can because we're all playing a part in it, man. 100%, 100%.
Would you? Oh, which reminds me. Oh, yeah, hold tight. Kelly Lines crew. All day. Yeah, the magazine. They got the team, man. Yeah. Go and check us you, out if on you're Instagram. Not looking, if you're listening and not looking, I'm holding up the County Lines issue one. Ten pound. Big shout out to uh, Bill Billy VIP and uh, Zoma Chrome Black. All day for the. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, man. You it's can the get one. the magazine from all of the all of the well known shops. Yeah, you're you associated. You're VIP, associated with this, aren't you? For real? VIP uh, Chrome and Black. Um, there's a lot Lester of people, and a lot of a lot of contributions, a lot of people involved in this. Magazine, yeah, bro, hundred percent, so. man. This was a team effort, and yeah. we've got a strong team. And I'm very thankful again to have pulled off what we have. Yeah, it's a great mag, man. I fucking vibe on it. Thank you very much, my brother. We appreciate that. Oh, Enough love, right, Keller? Yeah, it's been a pleasure, man. I could <laughs> literally sit here and build with you probably for about two, three hours. So, <laughs> oh, we have a part two then. How's that? I'm down, bro. I'm down, man. We'll give it some time, you know I mean? and then we'll come back and we'll uh, open this. Pandora's box again, man. That's right, building a platform here, man. Because you know what I mean? You don't have to like me, you just don't take this shit lightly, all right? Hold tight. All Eric crew regulars, you know what we're doing here. Killer Killer Podcast. Cut my G. Enough love, my brother. Concrete respect, fam. All day, all day. Don't forget to share. Sharing is caring, keeping it united in this place, all right? Cap, huh? Huh? What do you know about that? We are like inside fashion. Stay lucky, people. Don't talk to any strange ones, all right? Peace. (laughs) 